Um, so uh, welcome everybody. My name is uh, Jack Deckers. I'm a faculty member in uh, at Iowa State University in animal breeding and genetics, and one of the co-PIs on the Agricultural Genomes to Phenomes Initiative, which uh, sponsored by um, USDA NIFA. Very grateful for that. And this is already our uh, 14th field day. Um, I realize some of you may be dealing with a storm. Uh, we are actually at Iowa State where uh, the university is shutting down at noon, which is right at the end of the field day. Um, so hopefully we haven't blown away by then. But um, So today we're going to uh, learn about uh, a community of organisms that we often overlook when we talk about crop and livestock production systems and, and, and uh, improvement. And that's the, the microbiome and the mycobiome. Um, and we'll hear about how micro, microbiome research is being used to improve both crops and, and livestock. Um, we have two speakers. Our first speaker will focus on the plant side and the second speaker on uh, uh, an animal side. First speaker is Dr. Ben Holt from uh, Ag, Ag Bio, Biome Incorporated, the company in the, located in the Research Triangle of North Carolina. And they, um, their goal is to partner with the micro, microbes of the world to feed the world, and particularly focusing on crops and crop protection. Ben is the lead of the core technology platform and discovery program, uh, including the uh, micro, micro, microbial and genomics research plat platform of Ag Biome. And he's going to talk to us about the challenges of putting microbes to work for human benefit. And, I will turn it over to, to Ben. Uh, as usual, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. And if it's immediately relevant, I'll interrupt the speaker. Uh, but then there will also be an opportunity for discussion um, you know, through the chat or um, through uh, just speaking up uh, at the end of each talk. So Ben, floor is yours. Right. Let me set up my share here real quick. Turn that on. Great. Are you all seeing it? Yes. Wonderful. So uh, thanks for the nice uh, introduction. Uh, when I heard about uh, this initiative uh, connecting uh, genomes to phenomes, uh, I was quite excited because this is, of course, perfectly in our wheelhouse here at AgBiome. This is uh, uh, basically what we think about all day long, every day. This is a, uh, we sort of obsess over this. So um, uh, it's exciting to take a moment and talk about this. And what I decided to do was to give a, a really practical uh, presentation about uh, what a few of the, the challenges are for, for putting microbes to work for human benefit and, uh, and to, to give some ideas about uh, things that I think that you need to do if you are converting your thinking from working with say a model organism or a small number of organisms to working with, as we do, hundreds or thousands of genomes and their associated uh, uh, microbes. So uh, as a quick background for my presentation, and let me go ahead and turn on my laser pointer here in case I need it. Great. Uh, I'm going to start with a, an introduction to our platform and tell you a little bit about its uh, current state. And then I'm going to flesh out a couple of big challenges for uh, from our perspective for putting microbes to work uh, in, in the agricultural sphere. And in particular, I'm going to talk about data science and developing a, a useful architecture for taking advantage of, of your data science platform. And then I'm going to talk about our microbiology platform and uh, how you develop an isolation strategy around that. And then I'm going to give a couple of uh, brief uh, case examples of, of places where we've put all of this background work to use. Uh, one in soil fertility and one uh, around fungal disease. Okay, so with that, before I get started, uh, I wanted to just give uh, kind of a quick takeaway point. And the idea here is that uh, if you are going to build a, a complex system to connect genomic and phenomic data, this requires a purposeful architecture. Uh, and the parenthetical here is in a healthy appreciation for the organic nature of the problem. So I think of this as akin to building a city. Obviously, if you are putting up a building, you need a clear set of blueprints for how you will construct that building uh, and, and a very intentional uh, architecture for that. You also need to think about how all of the various buildings uh, are integrated together in that city. So you need to have uh, uh, an infrastructure that includes uh, water, electricity, and all those sorts of things. 
And you also have to have, as I said, an appreciation for the organic nature of the problem. Nobody can see what the complete city would be at the end of the process. So you have to make adjustments along the way. So that's the big takeaway for everything I want to present here today. And with that, let me tell you just a little bit about uh, ag biome and what we do. So as uh, Jack mentioned, we have the uh, vision to feed the world responsibly. And our idea is that we can do that by partnering with the microbial world for human benefit. Uh, in particular, what we believe is that many of the agricultural problems, so things like uh, uh, insect uh, disease, fungal disease, uh, um, the development of nematicides, soil fertility, uh, and a variety of other problems in the agricultural world can be solved by naturally occurring microbes if we can just be good at, uh, at finding those microbes and putting them to work for human benefit. So along those lines, we have been building a, a very substantial uh, and, and growing collection of uh, microbes for the past eight or nine years. Uh, and that collection is meant to take advantage of what you see over here on the left-hand side, which is the just the tremendous diversity that is uh, available uh, in the microbial world. And let me shut down my picture view here so I can see better. There we go. Um, so we have uh, been building a very large microbial collection as well as a uh, associated genome collection. So for almost every microbial isolate that we put in the freezer, we also uh, sequence the complete genome, which uh, gives us a lot of power in, in thinking about how to connect these genomes and uh, phenotypes that we're examining through various screening efforts. So to give you a sense of the, the current size of this collection, and for some reason, oh, there we go, sorry. So this is the, uh, our current collection as it, as it currently stands. Uh, we have about 8,000 uh, environmental samples, uh, over 20,000 uh, individual collections. Those individual collections are the environmental samples broken down into their component parts. So things like the phylosphere or the rhizosphere or the soil surrounding the roots, that sort of thing. Uh, we have then collected over 90,000 individual microbes, uh, and we expect to go well over 100,000 uh, in the next year. We have uh, associated with that then about 90,000 microbial genomes for each of those uh, individual isolates. And you can see up in the right-hand corner just uh, you know, how many genes this gives us access to, how many biosynthetic clusters this gives us access to. So it's a tremendous resource that we have developed and we're continuing to grow that resource. So the way that we take advantage of all these resources is through one of two major uh, screening pathways. So if you imagine this available uh, resource of, of microbes out in the environment, uh, we are capturing them and uh, we have the top of pathway that you're seeing here is what we call our biologicals platform. And what we're doing there is we are screening the actual physical microbes, the individual isolates for activity uh, typically, we will start with a, uh, an activity in the lab that we think will translate well to the field. We'll then move through greenhouse trials, uh, eventually to, uh, uh, to fewer and fewer active microbes uh, until we get uh, microbes that we think are particularly good at doing whatever the activity is that we are uh, uh, trying to discover. Of course, we learn a lot through this process, and so there is a feedback loop uh, with our data science functions to improve what we do in future screens. In a similar way with all of those uh, genomes that we are sequencing, we also have access to millions of genes. So we have the capability to uh, uh, predict genes that we think will be involved in various processes. Uh, here we primarily work in uh, insecticidal traits and the production of transgenic plants. And so we have uh, both of these pro processes happening uh, in parallel. So this leads to the first challenge that I wanted to talk about, and that's building a data science platform that will allow us to take advantage of this tremendous information resource uh, that we have in front of us. And what I've laid out here are a number of things that I think are, are truly and deeply important to think about if you want to build up a data science platform to take advantage of these kinds of resources. The first is that it's really important to think about what features and values are important for your data platform, 
So your data platform, uh, if, if it's just a few genomes or hundreds of genomes or thousands of genomes will vary different, will be quite different from perhaps what our data platform would look like. Uh, next, you really need to think about heuristic approaches and off-premises computing. And, and I'll talk a bit more about what I mean by that in a moment. Uh, it's important to automate all of the repetitive computations that you do. And again, I'll talk about that a bit more. Uh, next, you need to develop uh, strategically valuable APIs. So those are uh, application programming interfaces. I'll explain what those are in a minute and dashboards that take advantage of those APIs. And finally, it's important to create a system architecture that supports uh, data capture and extraction of biological insights. So let's break all those down in a little bit more detail. So the first one is uh, uh, simply having conversations around what features and what values are important to your company and what it is that you hope to achieve as you develop your, uh, your data science platform. So for us, uh, it was very important that our platform be scalable and extensible. Uh, we wanted it to be modern and cutting edge, always uh, uh, interested in using the, the most modern techniques. Uh, we wanted everything that we were capturing in our data platform to be discoverable, and we wanted to be very purposeful in those efforts. Uh, and as regarding uh, this, this feature of being discoverable, uh, we wanted that to support our company-wide values of transparency and uh, agency. So by transparency, I mean that we are a company that values virtually everybody in the company knowing everything that's going on across the company. Very, very few exceptions we make everything that we do here in a company uh, in the company available for everybody to know. The reason we do that is because we hire a lot of people who are really, really smart. And the more people that we can have thinking about uh, complex problems, the more agency we give those people, uh, the better solutions we come up with, uh, come up with for uh, difficult problems. Okay, so those are our general values. And let's talk a little bit about some more of those bullet points that I threw up a moment ago. So the first thing I wanted to show you was this example of, of, of a scaling problem. And this is leading to this idea that you need to think about heuristic algorithms. So uh, algorithms that approximate the right answer and are fast at getting to answers. And you wanna think about using uh, supercomputing. So if you look at, um, if for example, you wanted to compare every genome in your collection to every genome, to every other genome in your collection, the number of comparisons uh, uh, with very modest changes in the size of your collection increases rapidly. So just to give an example, our collection is approaching 100,000 uh, fully sequenced genomes. And if you were to compare every single genome in our collection to every other genome, that would be 5 billion comparisons. This is a process that we do uh, every month. Uh, it takes a couple of hours to run in uh, on a supercomputer through uh, AWS. And so it's a relatively trivial process for us. But you can imagine that there was a time before we set the system up, uh, before we had that architecture in place when this was far from uh, trivial. So it's really important that you think about these scaling problems as you grow out your collection. The next thing I wanted to talk about was uh, automated uh, data delivery or automating uh, your activities. Uh, so what I'm showing here as an example is a new genome coming into our collection, uh, and we will want to search that genome for uh, specific uh, uh, genes that have homology to uh, uh, particular genes of interest. So for example, our traits platform is interested in testing certain genes that they predict will be involved with uh, insecticidal activities. And what we don't want is for people to be manually repeating that process again and again and again. Once you start repeating a process on a regular basis, what you really want to do is automate that process so that what we're really doing is delivering those results directly to the scientists. So instead of thinking about all of this back end work, we can liberate them to focus on those high value experiments. The next thing I think you should think about in, in developing a data platform is to develop what we would call strategically valuable APIs and dashboards. And so for those of you who have no idea what an API is, that's a, an abbreviation for uh, application programming interface. And the way to think about an API is to, um, to analogize it, is to consider it as being like an electrical socket in your wall. 
So an, an electrical socket has really just one job. And that job is to deliver, uh, to, to deliver electrons so that you can plug in different appliances. You can plug in a variety of highly varied appliances to, to any electrical socket and drive those appliances. So in the case of an API, what you're delivering is some sort of information that can be used to drive a number of applications. So the particular example I'm talking about here is for every genome that comes into our collection, we uh, uh, do a variety of different calculations and annotations around that genome. And one particular example is for every genome, we make a genomic sketch. So this is one of those uh, heuristic approaches to uh, describing a complex genome with a fairly simple sketch that is descriptive enough to differentiate that genome from other genomes, but not so extensive that you can never uh, uh, calculate the answer to the problem. So we create a genomic sketch for every genome that comes in our collection, and then we can do these all by all comparisons of all of these sketches. What we end up delivering to the API is simply a set of measurements that say these two genomes are very close to each other or these two genomes are more distant from each other. That then can be translated as a set of addresses that can be read by applications that are designed to do that. So a really good example of applying that, that idea is an algorithm that we developed called Find My Friends. So the idea here is that you find a, a microbe that is active for a particular process. So let's say you find a microbe that has antifungal activities. And what you would like to do is find other microbes in the collection that are uh, evolutionarily very close to that microbe. Well, with our Find My Friends application, we can do that and we can do it in minutes. So we can pull from a collection of 100,000 microbes that is growing rapidly and very quickly get an answer to that sort of question. The final thing that I think is really important to think about as you're developing a data platform uh, around genomes and phenotypes is uh, how you're going to capture assay data. So as you're growing an organization, and this could be an academic organization or it could be a, a, a growing company such as ours, uh, what tends to happen is your assay data gets captured in individual notebooks or get caps, gets captured in Microsoft Excel uh, sheets, and it almost becomes a sort of uh, historical knowledge that's hidden, hidden away in little pockets throughout your organization. We want to avoid that. So it's very important to early on to begin to develop some way of, of consistently capturing uh, the assay data that you collect, all of your screening data, having data conventions around that, uh, and having a system to check the integrity of that data, to confirm that the data is what it's supposed to be, and to integrate that data with, in our case, your genomic data in something like the cloud, so that you can deliver the results of that data, once again, transparently to the entire organization. Okay, so those are some ideas around uh, how we think about our data science platform. And now what I want to do is switch and think a little bit about how we build our microbiology platform with the intention of finding microbes that have these uh, important agricultural features. So uh, three things that I wanted to highlight here are uh, the ability to target relevant taxa while working within the constraints of microbial cultivation, uh, the ability to isolate from appropriate environments, and then finally, balancing uh, your uh, exploitation of your current collection and exploration of, of new things that you would like to add to your collection. Okay, so let me break those ideas down a little bit in the same way that I did for our, our data science platform. So the first thing to acknowledge if you're working with microbes is that microbial diversity is just, uh, uh, it's almost impossibly vast to consider. So it's expected that there is something like a trillion microbial species on Earth. And so the point here is to say that an, an, an untargeted approach, one that just relies on chance, what you find by trying to cultivate microbes from, uh, from different environmental samples is, um, is pretty unlikely to identify a specific uh, activity of interest. So you need to take a targeted approach and be thoughtful about what you're trying to, to get, what you're trying to add to your collection what kind of problems you're trying to solve. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. I will just say though that 
that constantly shifting and thinking about new microbes to isolate from new environments is probably one of the most complex things that we do. It requires a tremendous amount of, of literature review, of experimental work to find out new ways to isolate things, and a heck of a lot of conversations amongst a lot of people. The next thing to acknowledge is that is that uh, culturing microbes uh, can be pretty tricky. So it's it's relevant to ask whether or not you really care about the microbial isolates. So in our case, uh, we we are trying very hard to uh, to look for biological products. So we expect to use the microbe the microbes themselves, the microbial isolates themselves, as the product in many of our cases. So we basically have to figure out how to culture. The microbes that we care about. Um, but it's important to recognize that if that's not the case for you, you may just want to think about uh, ways to capture um, microbes in, in, or the information that's contained in microbes in culture independent manners. So to give a sense of culturing bias and how it impacts us all, uh, one of our microbial researchers here, uh, Brant Johnson, who's actually sitting in the room across from me right now listening to the presentation, uh, kind of did an interesting calculation he said, uh, if you think about all of the microbes that are in the world and you converted that to the volume of the ocean, what's the size of the, the pool that essentially all of, of the, the industry, ag biome and all of our competitors are, are, are isolating from? And that turned out to be in his calculation, something akin to Lake, this little Lake Ann Washington up in the mountains uh, in, in Washington state. So you can see that we are all fishing from really a, quite a small pool. And so there's a real opportunity to differentiate by being thoughtful about the microbes that you're trying to isolate and being thoughtful about how you go about uh, doing that. Again, though, it's not trivial. So uh, in our case, what we try to do is isolate microbes uh, from a lot of different agricultural environments. And you can see from this figure that shows uh, uh, you know, where we've isolated things from that uh, we've isolated from uh, all 50 uh, United States. We also have isolated uh, a lot of microbes from uh, Africa as part of our Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation research. Uh, and we have typically isolated from agricultural environments uh, that we think will be uh, exposed to uh, pests and pathogens that we think are important. With the idea being that uh, uh, environments that have those, uh, those pests and those pathogens will also have microbes that are antagonistic uh, to those pests and pathogens. That said, um, it's worth pointing out that uh, predicting what environments will produce uh, the highly active microbes for a particular process is not at all trivial. And I don't know that we've, uh, that we've zeroed in on the perfect process here. And to give you a sense of what that looks like, uh, this, this figure is a couple of years old, but just to give you a sense of where some of our active microbes have been discovered for various uh, indications, so uh, fungal disease, animal health, insect control, biologicals, root knot nematodes, and herbicidal activity, you can see that we have been able to find actives from a lot of different environments for each of these types of activities. So it's, it's quite varied uh, um, where you might find these activities. So putting all of this together, thinking about uh, everything I've said so far about the development of your data platform and the development of your microbial platform, you can um, uh, extend that to thinking about how you want to build it as you go forward. And a point that I wanted to make uh, is that uh, what happens is, is most groups will tend to uh, put a lot of effort towards the exploitation side of the formula. So what I mean by exploitation is, you are uh, you're, you're in a, a, a mine and you're finding gold and the tendency is to keep mining from that same mine because you're continuing to find gold. And of course, uh, that makes sense and it should be a, a large part of your efforts. But a thing to remember is that you need to have a purposeful efforts towards exploring new mines, new frontiers uh, as you're going. Uh, and, and a reminder that the tendency for a lot of organizations, if you don't carve out a specific amount of time to focus on exploration of, of new microbes and new activities and new methodologies, 
is that you will default towards most of your act activities being uh, on the exploitation side. So as an example of how we've tied some of these things together, this is just a, a, a simple example. In the last few years, uh, we decided that we wanted to get more intentional uh, about adding uh, additional Bacillus subtilis uh, species to our isolate collection uh, or to isolates to our collection. And uh, we did that because from our uh, literature based research and our historical screening data, we had seen that for a number of indications, uh, Bacillus subtilis species uh, were, were highly active and were, were useful for us. So what we did was we went back and we reconsidered the environments that we were isolating from. We reconsidered and tested new cultivation processes. And we were able to pretty rapidly shift to a post-targeting uh, uh, set of methodologies that allowed us to rapidly uh, increase the amount of uh, Bacillus subtilis that we had in our collection. So the challenge then that's in front of us with all of this uh, platform that we have developed is to recognize that the universe of environmental microbes is, uh, is quite vast. And what we're trying to do is to figure out how to cut through all of that noise to, uh, to find solutions for various problems. Here we're showing agricultural pests, but it could be something like uh, nutrient availability or animal health or a variety of other areas that we've, that we've worked in as a company. And so all of these things that we've developed uh, in this platform that I've been talking about for the last few minutes uh, kind of fill in the gap between that universe of environmental microbes and the solutions that we're looking for. So because of these platforms that we've developed, we're able to, to do and to think carefully about strategic isolation. So for example, we want to isolate microbes with specific properties and we're able to make some predictions about where those might come from and how to go and get those. Uh, our data science platforms allows us to, to prioritize which things we test uh, so that we can sample a, a, a maximally diverse set of microbes from our collection. Uh, when we find hits that we think are interesting, we have the ability to go in and, and predict other microbes that are likely to have those same activities. We can also apply uh, machine learning approaches uh, where we are learning from the data of what microbes are active and what microbes are not active in various assays, uh, and then connecting that information to our extensive genomic information. So with that, what I'd like to do is just finish out my presentation by giving uh, some uh, uh, two examples where we're pulling together everything that I've just said uh, in a very simple and a very straightforward way to show you how this, uh, this might work in real time. So the first of these examples is uh, what we call our uh, soil uh, fertility project. And here, what we're looking for are microbes that improve nutrient uh, availability for plants. And we have taken, taken a sort of two approaches to think about that problem. One is to uh, improve our targeted environmental isolations. So here we are trying to, to look for um, environments that predict would be enriched for nutrient solubilizing and beneficial uh, taxa and to develop isolation strategies around that, uh, around those environments. So that's one approach. The other approach is to take advantage of the collection that we already have in hand. And here what we're doing is we are predicting gene features that we think would be involved in plant nutrient uptake. And we are looking for microbes in the collection that, that have those gene features. So let me just talk through each of those examples briefly. So in the first example where we're targeting uh, new environmental isolations, uh, it's a uh, uh, theoretically a very simple process, a very straightforward process, but of course in practice, there's a lot of work involved in this. And so what we've done is we first done a, a really deep dive in the literature to think about uh, taxa that we think would be important to isolate for this process of nutrient availability. Uh, and then we've gone back into our extensive uh, collection of environmental samples and chosen environmental samples that we think would be likely to be enriched for those particular taxa. And so what I'm showing you over here is a, a heat map uh, that um, we developed that is basically showing if you test these various media, 
and look for their ability to isolate specific taxa uh, that um, how well they, they do at, uh, at isolating those taxa. And you know, this is simply an example of what one of these processes would look like. Uh, sometimes we may not find uh, any media that do it particularly well and we have to go back to the drawing board. So it's an iterative process uh, that ultimately ends up with uh, a set of new isolates in your collection that you can test in both in vitro and primary screen assays for the activity that you're looking for. Again, in this case, for uh, solubilization or, or making nutrients available uh, in, in various substrates. So the other side of that is we decide that we want to go into our collection and, and look for uh, things that are in the collection that we think would be involved in this process. And so in this case, what we've done, uh, and, and this is all part of the same process, but in this case, what we've done is we've looked for uh, uh, genomes that have a number of selected gene features. So we selected 22 gene features that for various reasons we thought would be involved in uh, the availability of, of specific nutrients. And we can then go back through our collection and look for which genomes actually have those genes. And you can see that, um, first of all, we have thousands of, of isolates that have those genes. And I should say really quickly here that AIMS stands for Ag Biome Individual Microbes. So these are actual isolates that we had in the freezer. And so what we can see is, so for example, for uh, microbes that have 12 of 22 gene features uh, that we thought were interesting, we have 6,000 of those microbes. And so what we did here was we, uh, we split this up into a group that had a, a, a low gene count for these 22 gene features and a set that had a high gene count for those 22 features. We then did a downsampling by clustering all of these genomes because we, we didn't have the capacity to test thousands and thousands of these uh, to begin this process. So we, we clustered all of these using our all by all comparison API that I told you about a few minutes ago and picked representatives from each cluster from examples of the low gene count and the high gene count. That then gave us this representative test that we could test in, in various screens. So to show you how that worked out, here is what you see uh, if uh, for nutrient solubilizing activity uh, for the low gene count uh, microorganisms and for the high gene count microorganisms. And what you see immediately is, is that it's a obviously pretty strong uh, um, correlation between higher gene count and higher activity, but far from perfect. So what this does then is it generates the next data set for us to go back through all of these examples and especially if we we'll look at some of these interesting contrary examples, like here is one that has a low gene count but has high activity. Over here, there are examples of high gene count but low activity. So remember that the, the distribution of those genes is quite varied amongst all of these different microbes. So we can go back and apply machine learning approaches and other approaches to improve our predictive ability and improve our ability to target new environments and additional microbes from our existing collection. Okay, so that's example number one. I'm gonna give you guys one more example and then I have to close out. Cause I promised Nicole that I would keep this to about uh, uh, 30 minutes. So the next example is uh, uh, our uh, fungal disease project. This was a collaboration with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, and uh, again, we have started with this idea of targeted environmental isolations. In this case, we are uh, taking samples uh, from Africa. And uh, we have targeted really two opposing types of environments. We've targeted uh, samples from environments that are predicted to be low in fungal disease. Uh, in, in an area where we see fungal disease in some fields and not in others. And uh, we have also uh, targeted environments where fungal exposure is common. So uh, you can make arguments both ways. Uh, we are covering all of our bases. Uh, the other side of this approach is that we have, again, used the Ag Biome collection to, uh, to look for gene features that we think, in this case, will be involved in fungicidal activity. And there's a fair amount of literature on this, so we have a, a good starting point here uh, to look for our uh, uh, potential um, in-house actives. So I, I'm not going to, to, uh, to 
go into extensive detail about this figure that's over on the left, but I would point to, for those of you who are interested and excited to think about this kind of stuff, uh, Matt Biggs, one of our data scientists here at, at AgBiome, published a paper in uh, um, P-Biomes in 2021, and you should be able to find uh, more information about this if you look up that information after the presentation. But the general idea here is that for this project, we started by, uh, and we often do this, we started by testing a very diverse and semi-random set of microbes from across our collection. So again, we use our ability to cluster all of our genomes. We then sample a representative set and we begin to get an idea of what microbes are able to, to give us this antifungal activity and which ones are not. Uh, we then utilized um, what we call spectrum screening, which is uh, uh, microbes that have already been shown to have antifungal activity in the past, but not for the particular activity we were looking here. We ask whether or not they have that activity uh, that, that we haven't yet tested. So in this example, we were looking for um, uh, antifungal activity for uh, uh, sorghum anthracnose and uh, black cigatoka, two important diseases uh, in Africa. And uh, so from this, we eventually end up with a suite of microbes uh, that have activity and we move on to the next step. So what we, what we typically find is that the first microbe that you find that has really good activity uh, in some screen is not necessarily going to be your best microbe. So we use a process of finding uh, the local optima by what we call strain analoging. And for those of you who are used to thinking about chemical analoging, it's the same general concept. If you find a, a particular molecule that has an activity that is interesting, uh, the assumption is, is that other related molecules will probably have a, a similar activity. And so what you wanna do is test as many of those similars or those analogs to look for the one that has the best activity. So the idea is to find this local optimum. And so my final uh, data slide, let me jump to the next slide because it'll show you this uh, uh, as a case example for one of the strains that we found, is uh, we were doing a screen for Asian soybean rust. And so here on the left, you can see this red bar stands for uh, you know, the activity of this particular initial hit that we found against Asian soybean rust. However, this particular uh, microbial strain was essentially completely inactive against uh, Phytophthora or, or the, the late blight disease. So what we did was we used find my friends to find other microbes in our collection that were closely related to the original microbe and tested them in this same suite of spectrum uh, assays. In the end, what we found was a strain, in fact, a number of strains, but a particular strain that you see over here that had uh, the activity not only against the original uh, spectrum, but added uh, Phytophthora and even improved uh, in, in the sorghum anthracnose. So I think what you can see from all of this is that, that the development of that background architecture and being thoughtful about how you create your microbial platform leads to what I think are, are fairly straightforward and fairly obvious experiments. Uh, I don't want to take away you know, from, from the complexity of what we do, but really a, a lot of that complexity is in that background architecture building and platform building. And I can't emphasize uh, enough how hard that is to do and how much conversation and how much work it takes for, for teams to put that together. So to conclude all of this, I'll say that uh, what I'd hope you take home is that you need to be purposeful with the system architecture and collection building that you were doing. Uh, that complex models and methodologies are great, but they're really secondary to that, to that system architecture above. Uh, and then finally, you need to uh, simply accept that there's no perfect blueprint and to emphasize action in doing this kind of experimentation. So to, to finish things up, I'll just quickly acknowledge uh, Grant Johnson and June Go, who are our lead microbial researchers here at AgBiome and were incredibly helpful in putting the slides together today. Uh, and uh, the data science team and our microbial operations and microbial research teams for uh, all of the data that they've contributed to what I talked about today. So with that, um, I'll wrap up and say thanks a lot for listening. Glad Thank you questions. very much.
Thanks very much, Ben. Very, uh, very interesting and, and some uh, important messages for all of us. Uh, certainly an area that I hadn't thought much about. And then it's amazing to see the, the diversity of uh, microbes that you can tap into, but then also the challenge of uh, honing in on the right ones. So, uh, so yeah, so we have some time for questions. So please put them in the chat or, or just speak up. Um, and there's a question from uh, Mary Frances Laporte. Um, from the presentation, it sounds like AgBiome uses these predictive approaches for more exploratory analyses, uh, i.e. predicting which microbes will have the, the, the right genes, etc. Do you ever use approaches analogous to plant breeding or genomic selection to drive genetic gain in these microbe species? For example, to imp improve or breed better microbes? Yeah, so uh, it's a great question. Uh, it is a something that we are considering more heavily in, in a variety of areas. I, I will simply say that it hasn't been a heavy area of emphasis. We have mostly focused on finding uh, uh, microbes where the activities are um, sufficient uh, in, in their naturally occurring form. Uh, but you know everything that you're talking about there, from from driving evolution in the lab to uh, more purposeful engineering efforts, are uh, on the books. Uh, they just haven't been our top priority to date. Okay, then a question from Zibas uh, Serai. Um, we have isolated three strains of endophytes from a haplotype naturally growing in coastal Bangladesh. This has phosphate and other solubilizing activities under salt. How much would it cost us to do a genomic characterization of these bacteria? Oh, <laughs> that's a good question. So, so uh, I mean, uh, you know, it, it's it's okay. So that's a hard question to ask or to answer for for someone like me because I can I can tell you what it roughly costs us to isolate a microbe, sequence it and put it in the freezer. But you have to remember that everything we do is sort of at an economy of scale. So we have worked out relationships uh, with, with specific vendors. Uh, we have these processes in place. And so, you know, if I say to you, well, uh, you know, it takes us about a hundred bucks to put an isolate in the freezer, uh, that may not translate effectively at all to what it would really cost you uh, to do that. So what I will say is that you can certainly get a pretty good uh, genome sequence done for uh, for a few hundred bucks. Uh, you can get a, a, a you know a, a high quality, relatively closed uh, genome sequence that um, you can explore. And what I don't know is the extent of of data science support you would have for annotating and exploring and thinking about that genome. Mm -hmm. So it's a little tricky to give a, a you know a specific dollar amount. Thank you. Okay, um, then there's a question about uh, Find My Friends, uh, one from Emmerich uh, Larkin, uh, is it publicly available? And then also from Jeffrey Boutain, um, how similar is it to uh, the, the Oxford nanopores, what's in my pot algorithm? Uh, that's a good question. I, I have so of the latter question, <laughs> I'll say I have no idea about the uh, the, the nanopore uh, what's in my pot algorithm, but I'll be looking up, uh, you know, after this uh, uh, presentation uh, to the previous question. No, it's not currently uh, publicly available, but we have in um, some situations partnered with uh, uh, academic institutions for particular experimental. Um, uh, approaches and have used our, uh, you know, in-house algorithms and approaches uh, in those relationships. So if you think that there is a reason why we should uh, have a longer discussion and per perhaps talk about collaboration, feel free to reach out to me or anybody else here at AgBiome. We're always happy to have a conversation. Okay, and then uh, the last question, but if there's additional questions, keep putting in, in, them in the, in the chat because then uh, Ben can answer them. Um, um, online. Um, so question from Sachin Rus Rusky, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, what is the pipeline for the release of active microbes? Um, can they be used in organic production? And, and is ag, bi ag biome also looking for microbes with a unique, unique set of genome editing reagents um, using Find My Friends? 
Yeah, great questions. So uh, let's start with the first question, which is the pipeline. So we have a, a full development and commercial uh, wings in addition to our research wings here that, that um, will, in a phased approach, will take an active and move it through the stages of development into commercial. We currently have uh, one product in the market and a second that is uh, should be released this year. Uh, and that first product is a, is, is a strain of Pseudomonas called Howler. Uh, and uh, that is fermented at scale and is sold as an antifungal. Uh, it is OMRI listed, so it can be used both in conventional agriculture and in organic uh, agriculture. Uh, we always try to make uh, uh, and imagine making, making our biological products as, as both uh, available for conventional and organic. Uh, although I would say that uh, we are also uh, not against uh, combining them in thoughtful ways with pre-existing chemistries. So in some cases we are combining Haller and our next product, which is a, a, a strain of bacillus called uh, Thea, also an antifungal uh, a microbial isolate. Uh, we are combining them with uh, pre-existing synthetic chemistries in some cases to, uh, to reduce the amount of synthetic chemistry that's required uh, and, or to get a, a better response depending on the case. Mm -hmm. uh, what was the, I'm forgetting what the second part of that question was. Uh, Ms. Agbiome also looking for microbes with a unique set of genome editing reagents. Ah, uh, yeah. Find my friends. Yeah, so not only are we are we doing that, we uh, we have we built out a subsidiary uh, called uh, Life Edit uh, that was uh, completely designed around uh, identifying uh, CRISPR enzymes and other uh, DNA modifying enzymes in the collection. That uh, subsidiary uh, was recently um, uh, purchased by Elevate Bio, uh, and uh, AgBiome still has a stake. Uh, in, in the overall uh, Elevate bio company. Uh, and um, that's exactly what they're doing. So their, their uh, focus is on uh, human pharmaceuticals or, or, or human uh, diseases. Uh, and then we have retained the rights here at AgBiome for uh, CRISPR work uh, coming from the collection in the agricultural uh, uh, indications. And we are developing some ideas there as well. Okay, thank you very much. Unfortunately, we'll have to close it off there. But uh, again, if there's other questions, please put them in the chat. And there's also a Slack channel that will be open. So, um, so we're going to go to our next speaker, our second speaker, uh, Dr. Katie Summers. Um, she's a research microbiologist at the USDA in Beltsville in the Animal Bioscien Biosciences and Biotechnology Laboratory. Um, she specializes in understanding the role of the microbiome and antibiotic alternatives in pig, piglets, uh, especially during uh, the weaning transition. So when the piglet is removed from, uh, from the sow, from the mother. Um, and she's going to talk to you about us uh, about uh, the in interkingdom communications that occur between the piglet's gut my bacteriome and microbiome and how those affect performance. So Katie, turn it over to you. Thank you, Jack, for the introduction. Can everybody see this okay? Yeah. Awesome, thank you. Well, welcome to everybody. As Jack said, I'm gonna talk about the bacterium and the microbiome in pigs today. And I appreciate you sticking with me to the second talk this morning or afternoon, wherever you are. So with that, okay. So my lab is very interested in the role of gut microbes in piglet health. And while I show a piglet here, we know the importance of gut microbes go beyond pigs. We see it in any animal model you see, and we know it's important in humans as well, because these gut microbes alter the host health in many ways, from basic things associated with the gut, such as digestion, energy harvest, short chain fatty acid production. But also you might've recently noticed there's publications in how gut microbes alter central nervous system, and you'll see papers on that gut-brain axis, or axis, excuse me. But the gut microbes also play a vital role in immune development in an animal and maintaining immune homeostasis. And they also play a vital role in pathogen exclusion. So while these microbes are in the gut and they're communicating with each other, they're also playing a role of developing the host immune system, helping with health, growth, 
and excluding all of those potential virulent pathogens. So their role is very critical to overall animal health. Now our lab focuses specifically on weaning in piglets as a critical time point. As Jack mentioned, that's the time when piglets are removed from their mother. It's a period of stress and extreme changes in environment. They go from the sow milk-based diet to a feed-based diet. And this is associated with a predisposition to disease. Uh, scours or diarrhea is one of the most common diseases we see in that week or so post weaning. And when these piglets perform poorly during this period, they lose weight, they stop eating, they might be sick. When they have that disease or lack of growth, they never catch up to their healthier litter mates, making this a critical point where we could help the financial uh, revenue for producers and farmers if we could find a way to prevent this post weaning lag. Now in the past, antibiotics were put in feed to help promote growth, but also to prevent weaning associated diseases. But now with the ban on antibiotics in feed, we have to find targeted ways to have alternative growth promotion in animals in agriculture. So this is what our laboratory focuses on. Now the microbiome, as I define it, is referring to all of the microbes in the gut. Now microbiome encompasses the bacteria, the fungi, the viruses, all of the things in the gut that are microbial in nature. And today when I talk, I will be breaking it down further into the bacterium or the bacterial members or the mycobiome, the fungal members. So the microbiome develops over time in animals. What an animal is born with is not the same as when it is an adult. And many factors alter this uh, microbiome community, including the food, the geography of the animal, the genetics of the animal, the stress in the environment, and also the age. So what we see in the literature is a pattern of bacterial succession in the bacterium. So certain keystone species colonize the gut of piglets at birth. And as they're colonizing and reproducing, they're changing the environment. They're changing the pH, they're changing what is there. And that alters the gut environment to allow other bacteria to come in and now colonize that were not able to survive before. And this is called bacterial succession. And it's a reproducible pattern we see in the literature. So we can see that this is an important thing where a composition is made and it is maintained and reproducible over time. So we are interested in looking at this a little bit further to see if we can find ways to alter the microbiome, to promote growth, to prevent that post weaning lag and to help uh, the farmers with financial loss that have these sick piglets otherwise. So we are, in particular, I'm gonna talk a lot about the microbiome today, and you might be wondering why we study that. And it all started a couple years ago when we did a pilot metabolome study that suggested that histamine was playing an important role in piglet growth. And so we went back and we looked at piglets and we did just simple ELISAs looking for histamine in piglets. And what we found is that elevated histamine is associated with reduced piglet growth. So if you look here, the black bars are slow growing piglets and the white bars are normal growing piglets. And when you look at histamine at day one, post ferro, you see elevated histamine in the slow growing piglets. And while it is a reduced pattern at day 21, it is still significant. And so what is histamine doing? Why histamine? When we went back into the lit and looked at what histamine's doing, we came to the hypothesis that these piglets might have a low burden of fungi or a low allergic disease that's happening, that the mast cells are releasing histamine in response to the fungi that are present. And if you look in the literature, you'll see talk about failure to thrive. And oftentimes failure to thrive is due to low level asymptomatic infections. And in other models, even in human babies or mice, you can see that an antifungal regimen can actually re, uh, reverse that effect. And so we are very interested in the role that fungi might be playing. But we also kept in mind that fungi are very diverse. They are not the same as bacteria and they are part of what is called the rare biosphere. So they are numerically inferior to bacteria in the gut. They just do not have the numbers. 
So we started with a pilot study that was culturable. Now, as Ben touched on, culturing is not perfect. We knew that. We just wanted an idea of what we could see as the fungal burden in piglets over time. So in this uh, graph, you can see days post pharaoh, so from one to day 35. On the y-axis is the log CFU of fungi per gram of feces. So this is the fungal burden in these piglets over time. Now that red arrow is pointing to day 21, which is the day that these piglets were weaned and moved into a new pen from their mother. What you'll notice, and it's very striking and reproducible, is that the fungal burden is quite low from birth. We're talking less than two logs per gram of feces. But then once they're weaned, we get a significant increase in fungal burden in the feces that is sustained. And we see this as being reproducible and similar to pigs throughout the rest of their life. This is the level that we see. So this fungal burden stays consistent and is reproducible across genetics and geography. We were wondering where this fungi is coming from. So the piglets have lower levels. So we went and looked at some of the environmental samples, the water they're drinking in the pen, the colostrum from the moms, the sow milk, and the piglet feed that was stored, and also the sow feed that was stored. And interestingly, none of that had culturable fungi in any of the ways we tried to culture it. However, once you took piglet feed and put it into their nursery pen, within 24 hours, it had a significant level of fungi. So the fungi are there in the pen, but where are they coming from? And so we're interested in that. And our current hypothesis as we trace it back is that the moms had fecal levels of fungi that were quite high. And if anyone has seen a pig pen, you know the piglets are exposed to the mom feces. And so we think it's coming from that. But the colostrum and milk may be what is inhibiting the fungi from inhabiting the gut at higher levels due to the antibodies found in that milk. So we're working on that as well. But as we went forward, we see these reproducible fungi and we wanted to know what they were. And so we switched from culturable to sequence-based technology. And we did this utilizing a MySeq platform. So we took samples in this study from piglets that were two weeks post weaning. We just wanted to see what was in the organs. And so here you can see in purple bacterial samples that were 16S primer based. And fungal samples are shown in green and they are ITS2 based. And I'm gonna take a moment and say that when you're doing a microbiome study, it is not the same as a bacteriome study. A lot of effort needs to be put into doing the right protocols. So DNA isolation kits from Kyogen and so forth are not necessarily made to break through the cell structure of fungi compared to bacteria. So DNA isolation techniques need to be modified and primers are notoriously difficult for fungal species. There are 18S and ITS1 and ITS2 based primers and you need to do a little bit of legwork to figure out what is the appropriate primer design for your environmental sample. So taking that into account, and that was all done for all of these, you can see the Shannon index or alpha diversity in the bacterium and the microbiome are, have distinct patterns. The Shannon index increases across the GI tracts. So as you travel from the upper GI, from the stomach through the small intestine to the cecum, colon, and feces, we see increased alpha diversity. We do not see that pattern in the fungi. It's a little bit more all over the place. And when we look at the observed amplicon sequence variants, uh, these are what we use to look at what you could consider the species. Other ways to look at it would be OTUs. We prefer the amplicon sequence variants because it gets down to the nucleotide resolution. Here again, bacteria show increased observed amplicon sequence variants over time, where the fungi actually show the highest level in the stomach. And we believe that the fungal uh, ASVs are higher there because fungi have adapted, many of them, to be able to utilize diverse carbon sources, but also to survive lower pHs than most bacteria can uh, uh, survive from. And so we think they're taking advantage of that within the stomach. We went on and looked at the microbiome specifically here. 
Reviewers like to say that the microbiome is transient, it all passes through, nothing sticks, this is not worth looking at, but what we're seeing is distinct organ niche environments. So here we have uh, day 35 piglets as well. These are all fungal and it's broken down by organ site. So the reddish color is the stomach, purple are feces, the blue color is the lower GI tract, so cecum and colon, and the green are the duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. So what we see here are three different litters shown by the shape of the symbol. And you can see in this organ variation that we see distinct environmental populations by organ. It's not a transient uh, event because otherwise they would be all overlapping. What we see are distinct environments. So different fungi are inhabiting different organs for specific reasons, whether they are carbon source, uh, availability of different molecules coming off of the host or the bacterium, they create niche environments. And so that's important to note that these are not transient, but distinct environments. So we had been looking at organs at a single time point, but we wanted to know the temporal changes in piglets, right? We want that weaning transition. We wanna see what's happening over time. And so we followed uh, piglets in three different litters from one day post pharaoh to day 35. So again, two weeks post weaning, day 21 is when we wean. On the left, you can see the bacterium. On the top, we have the Shannon index for alpha diversity and below it, we see the evenness index. And you can see they show the same pattern of increased alpha diversity uh, over time. We see the opposite trend in the microbiome on the right. So the diversity of the fungal populations is going down over time. And that was intriguing to us because we didn't know what that meant or what that would mean for the host. So we went a little bit deeper. We looked at the beta diversity over time. And here on the left, the bacterium shows a beautiful temporal uh, beta diversity succession here from day one shown in the bottom left, and you can follow these time points as the piglet ages and the beta diversity shows those changes. And then you see a big gap as you jump over to the post weaning groups where day 24, day 28, day 35 are grouping nicely with the adult samples that were used as comparison in that light blue. We did also sequence the feed in the pens with them. And there's just one little dot here in the lower corner. Of all the feed samples, very few would actually amplify with 16S primers. And the one that did was significantly far from all the other fecal samples in the bacterium. When we look at the microbiome, it's a little bit messier, but still maintains that temporal uh, design where it shifts over to post weaning samples clumping together. And what we saw that was very interesting was the feed samples kept clumping with the older uh, animal fecal samples. So the feed is very similar to what we're seeing in the feces of these animals when we're using ITS primers. So we wanted to know what these uh, populations are. And so while I don't love relative abundance plots, they are helpful sometimes. So we're just gonna look at the pattern here. These are all bacterial. So these are the bacterial samples. On the x-axis, you can see the pre-weaned samples of three litters pooled compared to post-weaned samples here. We have seven adult fecal samples for comparison and a feed sample. So you can see at day one, we have a high level of Enterobacteriaceae. And then as the bacteria compete with each other, find ways to survive in the gut, we get these change in population over time. And it seems to start to normalize somewhat. There's variability, but day seven, day 14, day 21, we're looking pretty similar. However, once we wean, we see a distinct shift in populations, which makes sense. Their feed changed, their environment changed, and they're looking more like the adults as well. To zoom in a little bit, because this is a lot of colors going on, we looked at bacterial genera that were losing abundance over time significantly. And so here on the top are three examples of those. So bacterioides, Clostridium, and Escherichia, all were bacterial genera that started out high and then lost abundance over time. 
Now that's very similar to what other people have seen in the literature, which was good to see that ours was showing the same pattern. And we also saw bacterial genera that were gaining abundance over time, such as Latia, Prevotella, and Ruminococcus. Now Prevotella and Ruminococcus are often seen to be beneficial bacteria, uh, but that can also be strain specific, so we can't guarantee that these were good bacteria, so-called, uh, in this study specifically. When we look at the fungal composition, we see similar distinct changes at that weaning period. So once we get to weaning, we see a distinct shift over that starts to look more like the adult populations. You can see the feed here. When we look at the breakdown of feed, we see the Baryomycetaceae and Wallemiaceae, things like that. And those are interesting because those are often considered to be contaminants from agricultural dust or agricultural feed components. So these are fungi that are able to grow on the plants that are components of the piglet's food or found as debris from food that has crumbled in the pen. So that's an interesting finding that we are seeing that these primers actually pick up those kind of fungi. When we look at some of the ones that are statistically significantly changing over time in the piglets, we see on the top, these are the fungal genera that are losing abundance, mucor, cladosporium, trichosporum. These are all considered to be environmental. So it's not surprising that we would see these. These would be in a barn or a farm setting. We also see that these are dropping off. So they are not able to find an environment in the gut for them to persist. So these might be transient species that are just passing through based on their geography by the uh, piglet. Here on the bottom, we have fungal genera gaining abundance over time. We have Wallemia and Hypopechia and Kazakhstania. Now Wallemia and Hypopechia, so in orange and purple, show a trend of gaining abundance, and then starting to drop off. And Wallemia and Hypopechia are those agricultural dust and plant uh, fungi. So again, they don't look like they're able to find a home in the gut that they can persist in. But Kazakhstania is very interesting to us because at weaning, it becomes the most abundant fungi in piglet gut. So this is across the board, we see it in the adult pigs, we see it in directly post weaning and it persists. And we've seen it in piglets in Spain, in South America, we've seen it in multiple locations in the US and everything we've tested, we're reproducibly seeing Kazakhstania being abundant. And we want, wanted to, before I go to that, we wanted to break that down. What does that mean? Just because it's abundant doesn't mean it's necessarily important. Maybe it just likes the soy and the corn that is in the nursery feed and that's what it's persisting on and that's it. But we also wanted to know its role in its effect on the host, if there is one, beneficial or detrimental. And we also want to know its interactions with the other microbes in the gut. How is it uh, interacting with the microbes around it, such as the bacteria. And so we did some inferred interaction studies using a network plot made by Speakeasy, which is a freely available software that's pretty easy to use to orient you to this very messy figure. Don't worry, I'll simplify it in a moment. You can see the green circles are fungal samples. You can see the blue are bacteria. Now the red lines represent negative interactions occurring between these different species. And then the blue lines are positive interactions. And the thicker the line, the more statistically significant the inferred interaction is. So we're seeing interactions between bacteria and bacteria, bacteria and fungi, and fungi and fungi. So to zoom in as an example, we see Aspergillus, a commonly known uh, opportunistic pathogen that is negatively correlated with several beneficial bacteria. So the Lacnosporaceae, the subdolagranulum, and the Prevotilaceae are typically considered to be beneficial bacteria for the most part. And we're seeing across the board negative interactions with those. And so we found that to be very interesting, but we also noted that this was just a single time point, day 35, fecal samples, it doesn't uh, necessarily indicate everything. So we went back and looked at the organs as well. So if we look at the cecum and colon 
and we do these inferred interactions on the y-axis, you can see fungal species, and then on the x, you can see the bacteria and their interactions. So again, red is negative interactions, blue is beneficial or positive interactions. And so aspergillus is a pathogen. It's not too surprising that across its line, you can see multiple red interactions happening with species like ruminococcus, Prevotella, things like that. We were also interested to see that Kazakhstania, that very abundant fungus, was having multiple beneficial interactions. So predominantly beneficial interactions, especially with so-called beneficial bacterium. So we're intrigued by that. We're seeing Kazakhstania might be a potential beneficial uh, fungi. So just to sort of summarize what we're seeing across the board and across organ sites and feces and across different ages in the piglets, and I don't have time to show all of that, but overall, we're seeing Kazakhstania having substantially positive inferred interactions with these bacteria, while aspergill aspergillus, a pathogen, is having negative interactions. So that's all well and good, but how can we get this to mean something in our pigs? What, how are we going to harness this in piglets? And before I go on and break that down, just to bring us back and show, because I showed a lot of different temporal and organ studies, but the goal is to harness these interactions between the fungal species and the bacterial species to create a beneficial effect in the pig. Perhaps that is alternative growth promotion, perhaps it's pathogen reduction or pathogen exclusion. But based on our sequencing results, we're seeing that the fungal species, despite being numerically inferior, are more easily manipulated by things that are fed, which makes the microbiome an excellent target for feeding trials. Because while the bacterium seems to bounce back from antibiotics and other different insults introduced to it, the microbiome seems to alter and it seems to be more long-term. So this might be the key to having feeding uh, regimens that are actually productive in improving pig health. So, we looked closer at Kazakhstania slufiae as it seemed to be a potential beneficial fungi that we would like to harness. Now, most people don't know a lot about Kazakhstania. It's usually what? Never heard of that. It's part of the Kazakhstania telluris complex. It's kind of a cousin of the Candida species. So Candida albicans in humans, in us, it's a very common commensal in our gut. You'll see it in almost everybody's gut and feces, nasal swabs and vaginal swabs. And only under very certain circumstances can it react as an opportunistic pathogen. But because of its highly related um, genetics to the Kazakhstania, we wanted to keep that in mind because it could potentially be an opportunistic pathogen as well. So we went to characterize it further. There had been a study or two out of uh, Germany that looked at it and determined that the Kazakhstania slufiae cells were especially high in nitrogen and lysine, which might be beneficial to the piglets. And they did a quick feeding uh, study with a few pigs where it showed increased short chain fatty acid production and a reduced fecal pH, but they didn't go too much further than that. And we wanted to understand the ability of Kazakhstania to interact with its environment. And so in the laboratory, we first started by taking a Candida albicans isolate from humans to compare to the growth rate of Kazakhstania slupiae isolated from our piglets. And they reproducibly grow beautifully in vitro. And this is just one example. We've tried multiple different nutrient medias and so forth. What's interesting is Candida albicans always grew significantly to a higher optical density than Kazakhstania slupiae. Kazakhstania just doesn't seem to grow to high levels in vitro. However, we were able to see that it is a dimorphic fungi, which means it can grow as a yeast or as a hyphae. So here we have examples of this fungus under the microscope, and you can see some yeast, these circular oval shapes, and you can see here budding yeast, so baby fungi being born. And you can also see the examples of the hyphae. So Kazakhstania uh, can grow in a hyphal manner. These are pseudo hyphae. 
And oftentimes fungi use these to grow in biofilms and to grow in thicker density, which we do see that Kazakhstania is able to create monoclonal biofilms. But what's important to remember about dimorphic fungi is that the yeast and hyphal versions of these microbes are recognized differently by the immune system. When the immune system sees a yeast version of a fungi or fungus, it does not react the same as it would to a hyphal version. And because of that dimorphic switching, fungi that are pathogens often utilize that to evade the immune response. They hide because if the host saw them as a yeast, they switch to hyphal growth and they can kind of go incognito that way. And the host has to recognize that entirely all over again, delaying the immune response, allowing them to escape and get that extra time to grow. But hyphae does not necessarily mean pathogen. And so we wanted to look closer at these biofilms and see interactions between them and the bacteria in the gut. So what we did is we grew Kazakhstania biofilms in the laboratory. And we compared those to Kazakhstania biofilms that were exposed to bacterial supernatants of interest to pigs. So these are three examples of bacteria isolated from pigs. There's Lactobacillus acidophilus, Lactobacillus fermentum, and Enterococcus faecalis. And all of those bacteria were grown to density and then their supernatants were removed and filtered and the Kazakhstania biofilms were grown in the presence or absence of those supernatants. So no bacteria, just the bacterial supernatant. So whatever that bacterium released, whatever molecule was given off by it, is what was able to be exposed to the Kazakhstania. And what we saw is this cross-kingdom communication. So Kazakhstania grown in the presence of Lactobacillus acidophilus supernatant actually had almost twice as dense biofilms. So in the presence of this supernatant, these biofilms were more optically dense and complex. The lactobacillus fermentum didn't seem to have much of an effect, while Enterococcus faecalis, which is often considered a pathogen, actually reduced the Kazakhstania biofilms. So it prevented these biofilms from becoming as dense. And so that's important to point out that these bacteria and the fungi in the gut are able to communicate and are able to alter the growth of each other. And so that's important in keeping in mind different treatment options because you're going to be having far greater effects than just altering the one microbe you're targeting. So right now we're currently doing more of these microbiological assays for biofilms, including some competitive exclusion and inclusion studies. And what we're also doing is isolating the quorum sensing molecules utilized by this fungus to be able to interact with the bacterium in the gut of pigs. So we're currently working to isolate those. And we're also doing studies looking at the short chain fatty acids and their ability to inhibit or induce Kazakhstania sloopier growth or its ability to do dimorphic switching between yeast and hyphae, but also vice versa. What is Kazakhstania sloofia doing to the short chain fatty acids in the gut in live pigs? And then we're, we, this year we sequenced and uh, published the draft genome for Kazakhstania sloofia. It's a highly complex fungus. And so we have not annotated that yet. It's gonna be a long haul for that. It's a complex fungus, unfortunately. So we're working on that and then also doing feeding and combinatorial trials. So Kazakhstania sloopia has been fed to pigs and we're going through that data now. But some of our inferred interactions have shown other microbes of interest, different bacterial species that are associated with piglet growth, uh, certain clostridium species. And so those are also some of the trials we're working on as well. And the microbiome is a very complex data set, but it is not the only factor. So going forward, we're also going to be doing some machine learning where we do combinations of highly complex data sets and train the data to tell us which molecules or which genera are important in piglet growth. So we can do targeted approaches to alternatives to antibiotics and alternative growth promotion. So the conclusions and implications of our work are that fungi 
although being low in numbers are important to piglet health and they are available to interact with the uh, bacteria in the gut as well. And the mycobiome shows different temporal and diversity patterns in the piglet gut across time and organs. We also see the mycobiome is more malleable than the bacterium, making it an optimal target for treatments and alternative growth promotion. And we want to find ways to prevent disease. We want farmers to not be losing money by these piglets that have the post wean lag. So these are important to keep in mind as we look forward to those. And then Cossacksonia slufiae is the most dominant post weaning fungus. Is it the pig version of Candida albicans in humans? Can it be an opportunistic pathogen? We're not sure. Nothing at this point points to that. It has no antifungal uh, resistance seen, and we tested across six different drug classes. Uh, it seems to be supportive of piglet health across the board, and there's no incidence of Kazakhstania disease in pigs in the literature. So it seems highly likely that this might be a good target and we're looking into that more. With that, I'd like to acknowledge some of the people who have done the work. Uh, Dr. Ann Arfkin was a previous postdoc who did a lot of the studies, and my support scientist, Julie Fry, has also been vital in some of my students who did this work specifically. Thank you to my collaborators and some of my supplemental funding. And just to finish, I'd like to mention that we're hiring, we're starting our large machine learning studies and we are hiring a postdoc. So if you're interested, please feel free to email me and I'll get you the pertinent information. And with that, I thank you for your time and I would love to take your questions. Thanks. Hey, thank you very much, Katie. Very interesting. Uh, and I think it also uh, affirmed to me why, why I've stayed away from the microbiome because it very quickly gets very complex, but it's obviously very important. Yes. Um, There's a couple of questions, um, one from Sachin um, about gluten and peanut sensitivity, that they are less prevalent in Asia and Africa, but when immigrants from those areas move to the West, uh, they, they often or they can uh, develop sensitivity later in life, uh, but their children uh, show, also show a very high prevalence to these uh, food sensitivities, uh, even more than the Western population. Question is whether you think that these foods, food sensitivities could be managed by altering the gut microbiome. Potentially. Um, so way back when, when I did my PhD, I was actually in an asthma and allergy laboratory and they did all pulmonary work. And I came in as the gut person to see what was changing because the idea is that the more antibiotics you're exposed to younger in life, the more likely you are to develop allergies and asthma down the road. Because when you take an antibiotic, it actually alters your mucosal immune response, not just in your gut, but in your lungs, your reproductive tract and all of that. So these changes in your gut bacteria and fungi are changing the immune response for the whole person in that case, or pigs in our case. So while I do not know the mechanism behind that, and we would love to know how antibiotics do that, I think it does point to the fact that we can manipulate allergies and asthma type responses, those TH2 immune responses through some gut manipulation. Um, now, the immigrants coming over, there's more to that. I don't know any of their medical data, of course, but we also have different food types here too. What we eat here is not the same as Africa. So that's also altering the gut. So these all, all these signs point to, yes, potentially those sensitivities will be managed down the road by when we know more and can alter that. So on that point, so Siba has a related question um, with regard to manipulation of the gut mic microbiome. So how can you ensure that they persist, that the useful bacteria persist and uh, can thrive in the gut? You can't. So that's, that's the goal of our lab, right? We want to learn more. So when you think about the microbial network, it's in the gut, just one organ at one time point, you have all millions of bacteria and many fungi in there and viruses and the host. So you've got the epithelium as well. All of these are close together. They're interacting. All these molecules are being uh, produced and certain microbes can recognize them, certain can't. And so it's this busy, 
very crowded area where there's lots of communication. And what happens if you knock out microbe A? Does that eliminate the food source for microbe B and D, but then C can take off? Like you, these networks are very complex. So many studies are needed to ensure that the useful bacteria are what are being amplified and not the bad ones. And so a lot of this comes back to some very basic microbiology that needs to be done. Okay. Um, question from Jeffrey. Um, in the MySeq project with the 16S and IPS2 regions, uh, very informative. But have you considered using longer reads, either the PacBio or Minion platforms, to detect native DNA and annotate, annotate cryptic fungal species? So um, the draft genome we did of Kazakhstan Yuslupia was a combo of Illumina and PacBio reads. So it's a pretty well-covered genome, even though it's a draft. Uh, so we did use PacBio. We have not used Minion. Um, Metagenome studies have not been useful. Uh, because of the inherent rare biosphere that the fungi are. So when we do metagenome, we miss the fungi altogether. So that's another option we can't do, but we do use PacBio. We're considering Minion. I know there's one on campus that we can use. We just haven't gotten there yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Question from Afshin, and I'm not sure I fully understand this. Maybe Katie or, or Ben may. Uh, are you investigating the mechanisms of the enhancement and effect of resistance of fun fungi fungi in animals and plants. Enhancement effect of resistance. Maybe uh, Afshin, if you're if you're on, maybe you can unmute and clarify. How can this? Okay, so this fungi that I showed today, Kazakhstania, does not demonstrate any antifungal resistance, so that's good. Um, it seems to be high in amino acids like lysine and nitrogen and helps produce more short chain fatty acids like butyrate that are considered beneficial in the gut. Uh, we also see beneficial interactions with like lactobacillus acidophilus. So by promoting a healthier gut environment, we might be preventing infectious disease. We might be promoting growth, uh, things like that. I do not have a mechanism yet. We're not there yet, but we're trying to get there. Okay. Um, do you ever, another question from Jeffrey, do you ever recommend a DNA extraction protocol for fungal DNA in environmental samples? Yes and no. So um, Kyogen has created a line of DNA isolation kits that are called the Pro Kits. So there's like a DNEZ Pro Kit. And I believe they have two of them now, but I apologize to Kyogen if they have more than that now. The Pro Kits take into account some fungal species. So those can be a useful, good starting point to go with. Not every environmental sample is the same, but I know for our animal samples, the uh, Dionysi Pro Kit worked very well in pig and chicken samples and uh, other environmental samples. So that'd be a good place to start. Feel free to email me too if you have a certain question. Okay, I, I wanna ask a question and, and maybe Connecting it back to Ben's talk, uh, of course, in, in Ben's case, uh, they use a lot of sequence data from lots of different microbes. Um, and um, Katie, what you're talking about is, uh, you know, you're starting to sequence some of these um, species, but uh, a lot of the work is still at the level of, you know, understanding what's there rather than what they do, right? So. So how do we get to where where Ben is? Where Ben is, uh, you know, what what is it going to take? And maybe Ben, you can chime in in, in also. Well, let yeah. me just jump in real quick and say that we're cheating in that you know mostly we're 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 doing microbes, right? Bacteria and the genomes are considerably smaller and much simpler than what Katie's dealing with. So we also do fungal genomes, but you know, as Katie said, uh, uh, and, and the reason why they're doing some combination work with Illumina and Pack Bio is to solve part of that problem, right? It's, it's a much trickier thing to close a fungal genome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unfortunately, they can be polyploid. And so based on your sequence, uh, you, you don't know necessarily if it's a diploid or a polyploid or whatever when you get those big data sets back and those are difficult. And the fungal studies have all lagged behind because they are harder. The primers aren't as good. The databases aren't as good. Like DNA is harder to isolate without damaging. It's, 
it's difficult. It lags behind the bacterium at least a decade, but we're, you know, we got to do those preliminary studies, see what's there and start the field going. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I think Katie pointed out something really interesting too, which is that uh, almost all of these environments that we're interested in are, you know, dominated by the weeds. So trying to, to pick out the thing that you're interested in, which is often the interesting and important thing, uh, it can be extremely hard, if not impossible, as Katie said, you know, like they, they'll do a bunch of metagenomic sequencing and they don't even get any fungi, even though you know damn well that they're there, right? <laughs> so it's, that's tricky. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, obviously lots of challenges ahead. Um, and we're at, uh, at noon and so Iowa State is closing down and so we'll have to close this field day also. But it's been very interesting and and, and uh, I think it was also good to have both the animal side and the plant side. And, you know, as Katie pointed out, and Ben also alluded to it, you know, there, there are very important connections there. You know, the microbes that or fungi that grow on the crops that have an impact on, that then either thrive or have a positive or detrimental effects on the animal. And so I think there's still a lot more to be learned, but also a lot of opportunities for um, integrating and working across crops uh, uh, crops and livestock and the microbiome is a is an important uh, component of that so with that uh, close off this field day i want to thank uh, uh, nicole scott again for um, uh, a lot of her organization the work in organizational work in getting these uh, these field days uh, running and off the ground and and also uh, eddie and carol at uh, iowa state um couple of things if you have yeah additional ideas for field days please let us know um slack channel will be uh, is open so you can continue the conversation um field days every wednesday uh, every third wednesday of the month 10 30 to 12 um us central uh, our next field day in january will actually be on seed grants so there's another uh, RFP for seed grants that will come out on January 5th. And then um, the field day that follows that will focus on um, those seed grants. Uh, there will be another training workshop in, um, in February and topic still to be determined. Um, finally, if you want to fill out the surveys, uh, please do. And uh, other than that, please, all of you stay safe uh, during the storm. If you're going to be uh, under the storm, here in the US uh, the next, in the next, or oh, well, this day. Please stay, stay safe and uh, um, wish all of you uh, happy holidays. And thanks all for attending and participating. <laughs>